uh, about the very, very beginning of museums and how our museum mirrors that same inspiration. So it's called Welcome to Wonder, the presentation, because uh, the first museums were often referred to as cabinets of wonder. They were the result of discovery, of people getting out of their own backyard and culture, getting on boats and going and seeing parts of this earth that they never uh, had encountered before. And coming back with flora and fauna and sketches of, of wildlife that they had never imagined, as well as an appreciation for the things that were made by human beings in other cultures. Silks and embroideries and porcelains and kinds of sculpture and architecture. So to this day, the two types of museums are those that concentrate on what has been made by the hand of God, of nature, flora, fauna, and that which has flowed from the imagination of human beings. Um, this is how we have defined art from the very beginning in an ancient way that we think is very healthy. So if you look at the most prolific art-making peoples in the history of the world, they never, in their indigenous language, have a word that means what we think of when we say the word art. They have a process word that mean, uh, means beautifully performed or well-made. And I think that's a much healthier definition. And it's not that the artist, you know, do the feeling for the rest of us. It's, it's a way of inspiring everyone to be to live an artful life. Uh, how they use language, how they plant a garden, etc. You know, just all the acts, the daily acts of life. Our artists are in what are called intuitive, uh, self-taught artists. We don't say if you've had a, a month of art school, you're damaged goods, but almost, you know. Uh, we're, we're really looking to people who may not think of what they do as art. They may have just been getting up every morning for the past 40 years to build a utopia, a Garden of Eden, in their backyard. And they're not trying to get into galleries or museums. It's just flowing from that. Um, it's interesting. Uh, so often it is the trained artists that will go down a country road or go in some back street and identify a visionary artist. And the same was with our sister museum, the Musée de la Route in Lausanne, founded by Jean de Buffet, when he was so tired of the commercialism of the contemporary art world that he himself stopped making art, went back to his parents' export and import wine business and if you've heard of like Champagne Brut, he said he put together the art that started to inspire him again. And that was works by shoemakers and housewives and prisoners and mental patients and psychic mediums. And he put together his, his collection of art brut. But the word brut is great for champagne, meaning raw in French, but doesn't work well you know, with English. So we are the American Visionary Art Museum, a national museum uh, that by unanimous vote of Congress, an education center. So this is William Kurelik, who is Canada's probably best known indigenous artist. He uh, was from Czech parents and he loved nature. And as a farm boy, he painted the barn door with what he loved in nature most. And his father almost beat him to death. And he was sent to the only art therapist in the UK kind of uh, British system in England uh, to recover. And he was catatonic for a time. Do you remember those time life books that had the brown spines and one would be on the mind? You know, they had all different subjects almost like a, a child's encyclopedia, a little bit more sophisticated than that. He was the poster boy for schizophrenia, totally 
just a label that did not fit. Um, but when he came out of his worst shape, uh, he painted a blind man stumbling in the desert with a dying tree in the background. And he said, where am I? Who am I? Why am I? And I think that everybody gets to a point in life where things conspire that we ask those big questions. That's our three-ton whirly gig made, uh, uh, it's 55 feet tall by 45 feet tall, made by Vala Simpson, a farmer who, when he lost his do favorite dog, made a tribute as a whirly gig to him, and then it kept on going. Uh, often the magic age with visionary artists, be it Howard Finster or Simpson, um, Vala Simpson, is 60. You've kind of, you know, know who you are, uh, and you don't care what other people think. And that's a great grace. And he made these wonderful things. And we had a relative of Calder's come to visit the museum. And he said, oh, my uncle would have been so, great uncle would have been so smitten. And it plays with the wind. You know, in the middle of the 16th century, I, I brought up uh, Rumi for a good reason, why he speaks so much 800 years later to today. And I think that great visionary minds, be they inventors or uh, people finding cure for AIDS one day or anyone who solves a major problem, and particularly in the world of muse, is that they are attuned to listening within, that still small voice within. And uh, in many ways, you call it the hypnagogic state when you are a person who, like Salvador Dali, learned the technique from Capuchin monks, where um, he would wait till he was absolutely exhausted, sit in a chair, and he would have some car keys or keys in his hand and uh, a porcelain plate below. And he would wait until he just nodded off. His hand would release the keys, and they would clink and wake him up. And he recorded, he would go and paint whatever he saw in that between state, between waking and sleep. Uh, he said, matchsticks are like human beings. They, his work showed the beauty and strength of what happens when we work together. And these are our seven education goals. And when I first opened, a lot of people went, ugh, they're so spiritual, ugh. You know, and then they won the AAM uh, best practice uh, uh, you know, in their big book on best practices. And uh, they have founded the Lower East Side Girls Club in New York that's now in five countries. And uh, they're used by many, many people, literally verbatim. They were uh, the incorporation statement for the Girls Club. And then finally, uh, this notion that creative acts of social justice constitute life's highest performance art. So my friends are people like Patch Adams, who's never charged a dime, you know, for medicine. And um, I, I like people who use their our, our brief time here on Earth to try to make things better for someone else as well. And uh, it's the hardest thing to do is to make social change. You have to be fiercely creative. So the way we define artistry, again, is in how we live the life. So you'll see miraculous works of art, along with the most beautiful quotes that you can imagine.